Committee on Intergovernmental Affairs of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform and the Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security of the Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Before I begin my opening remarks, I would like to recognize United States Capitol Police K-9 technician Jason Conlon and his four-leg partner, Jax. Thank you for coming, and uh, Jax is pretty popular in this, in this hearing. I thank you both for attending today's hearing. I think I speak for all of my colleagues here today when I say thank you for all you do to protect the complex in this nation. And having been one of the uh, Republican members on the baseball field that morning, I know the willingness of the Capitol Police to, 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 to pay the ultimate sacrifice for us. And that's literally what Officers Griner and, and Bailey did. They put themselves in harm way, harm's way for us. And we are all profoundly grateful for the service of our Capitol Police. Technician Conlon and Jax are an important reminder that canines are an integral part of our national security framework and serve in all levels of our government, from the United States Capitol to local municipalities. Canine teams are working to save lives every single day. Dogs like Jax provide unmatched capabilities to secure our safety, including the detection of explosives, narcotics, concealed humans, currency, firearms, electronics, and chemicals, and are also used in search and rescue missions. Simply put, canines are an invaluable asset to our country. Over recent years, international demand for canines has increased dramatically. Experts report that this heightened demand has led to a shortage of suitable canines, making it difficult for the United States government to obtain the working dogs it needs. TSA has reported that the federal government is working to improve and expand relationships with domestic vendors. This uh, is a step in the right direction, but more work needs to be done. Efforts to obtain more dogs have reportedly been slow to materialize. In, May, um, in a May 18, 2017 hearing, TSA's Threat Assessment Division Director Melanie Harvey testified that TSA is working very closely with domestic vendors to build up, canine, uh, build up the canine supply, but has not identified a large enough supply to domestically do that. Industry professionals and domestic vendors have also reported difficulties in working with the government's canine procurement program, citing challenges in getting their dogs accepted for work. We are hoping today's hearing will serve as a starting point toward resolving those challenges. My primary hope for this hearing is that we, it will help us evaluate how we can increase the use of canines in areas that are clearly vulnerable to attack, including public areas of our airports, train stations, as well as other areas with high concentrations of people. To that end, we have a diverse panel of professionals today who will present information and ideas about how our government uses canines, and I look forward to hearing what they have to say. We must ensure that government agencies are able to purchase qualified canines so that they can meet their critical national security missions. I thank Chairman Katko for his leadership and partnership on this issue. I thank Ranking Member Demings. I have had uh, conversations, extensive conversations with both of them. That, that really led to this hearing, and I, I am very grateful for the work uh, that they put in on this. Clearly, this is an area that we can all agree deserves our attention and support. I now recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Affairs, Ms. Demings, for her opening statement. Thank you to our witnesses for joining us here today. Uh, before we begin, I do want to take uh, just a moment to acknowledge of the tragedy that occurred in Las Vegas. Um, I imagine that we all have reflected on what happened. And as a former chief of police, um, I can tell you I have had many sleepless nights wondering what I could do to keep my community safe, let alone trying to understand what would lead somebody to commit such an unspeakable act. Uh, when President John F. Kennedy was speaking of foreign threats, I believe his words go to the heart of what each first responder holds within uh, to do their own work. I quote him, we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship to keep America safe. With that, I turn back to the subject for which we are here today. On this day, we have the opportunity to discuss the crucial role that K-9 security plays in protecting our local airports, transportation hubs, sports arenas, stadiums, and other large venues. 
Prior to serving as Orlando's police chief, I served as commander of the Special Operations Division where I had the honor of managing our canine operation. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle argue that more canine security is needed. I agree. Unfortunately, the President's budget proposal would cut state and local programs. Under the budget proposal, TSA's visible and intermodal prevention and response teams, which patrol public spaces and airports, train and bus stations, would be eliminated. Under the budget proposal, the Law Enforcement Officer Reimbursement Program, which provides support to local airports by placing local law enforcement teams alongside TSA checkpoint officers, would be gutted. This would cut $45 million in funding that reimburses local police departments for canine security at more than 300 local airports. I believe such cuts would put our state and local security forces in jeopardy. Our nation's security is my top priority and should be Congress's number one priority. Congress must stand with state and local police. And with that, I again thank our chairman for this opportunity and thank our witnesses for sharing their testimony today and I look forward to this very important discussion. Thank you. I now recognize the chairman of the Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security, Mr. Katko, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, before I proceed, I do want to acknowledge uh, the tragedy in Las Vegas. Uh, as a federal organized crime prosecutor for 20 years, uh, I made it my life's mission to take dangerous we weapons out of the hands of dangerous people. But this gentleman points up a specific, specifically difficult uh, person to detect, and we got to we have to learn how to do better to detect people like that that have gone off the gone off the grid, so to speak. So uh, with that, I'll I'll talk to a, a little happier subject, and that's dogs. My dog Sadie's happy I'm here today. I told her before I came down my black lab that I'd be testifying, I'd be asking questions of all of you, and she said to say hello. Uh, canines are an essential asset to our national security. Due to their intelligence, superior sense of smell, and versatility, canines provide an unparalleled service to law enforcement. When canines' natural abilities are supplemented by selective breeding, training, and cutting-edge developments in science, they become one of the most effective security tools for public safety. While the utility of one certain technology over another does ebb and flow based on how terrorists seek to do harm, the security benefits of canines will always be a crucial element to keeping Americans safe. And I want to commend my colleague to my left here, Mr. Rogers, who has been championing this cause for many years, at least since I've been in Congress the last three years, and I know long before that as well. The concept of, work, of a working dog is not unfamiliar to most Americans. They are a viable presence in airports, train stations, and other public areas. From my experience as chairman of the Homeland Security Committee's Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security, I've seen firsthand the data proving the security effectiveness of canines and mitigating the rapidly evolving threat landscape facing America's transportation systems. Oftentimes, canines present the most effective and efficient means of detecting new threats. Again, I stress effective and efficient, as they can be retrained and deployed as new threat streams and terrorist tactics emerge. Canines are utilized in a variety of different settings and roles for the detection of people, narcotics, and explosives and weapons of mass destruction, amongst many other items. <clears throat> As we strive to be proactive in mitigating threats to the traveling public in transit hubs, airports, and other venues, canines are an essential component of our ability to enhance security. Because of their versatility and reliability, canines are increasingly sought after by federal, state, local, and tribal agencies, as well as private st stakeholders and foreign governments. This spike in demand for both canines domestically and internationally far outstrips our current ability to produce an adequate supply of dogs. The United States is competing with many other nations to procure canines that meet rigorous standards, and a shortage of quality dogs presents an impending, impending security risk. In an era of heightened terrorist activities, it is critical that the domestic working canine industry has a robust development and training pipeline that feeds into a seamless procurement process. The purpose of today's hearing is to learn more about the challenges that the canine industry faces. 
We also want to ascertain how we can better develop a strategy and more reliable infrastructure for domestic breeders and training facilities. Lastly, we want to learn how the United States government can better communicate its needs with its private sector canine partners to help facilitate future growth of this essential security asset. A strong domestic breeding industry not only makes all of us safer, but creates new jobs and opportunities in our communities. I think it'd be great if we got to a point where we stopped importing dogs from Belgium and wherever else and had the programs here and maybe got it to such a point where we're exporting them to around the world because the quality is that good. However, we have to make our government, we have to make sure our government is doing everything it can to present a strategic and comprehensive vision for its canine needs and that this vision is effectively communicated to the industry in order to foster necessary growth. We must also ensure that with the rapid increase in demand for canines, we are ensuring the quality of our security standards and procuring only the most highly trained canines. We must also ensure that we are properly incentivizing breeders and trainers to meet the demand for canines today and far into the future. Ms. Goff, Lieutenant Smith, and Dr. Otto, I encourage all of you today to be candid and frank in your testimony. We convene this hearing in order to hear directly from each of you about how Congress can better support this critical layer of our national security. We all share the same goals, and we all want to better understand what obstacles currently exist that may prevent the growth of our domestic canine industry. Canines are an invaluable safety and security asset, and the need for more canines will only continue to grow. I would like to thank my colleagues, Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Demings, and Ranking Member Watson Coleman for joining me in calling for this hearing today. Security is not a partisan issue. That's one of the things we truly enjoy about Homeland Security is that it's not a partisan issue. And we must work together in a bipartisan fashion to advance important issues that affect the safety and security of all Americans. And with that, I yield back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security, Ms. Watson Coleman, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you to the members of both subcommittees for convening this hearing and to the witnesses for being here today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Sunday's horrific mass shooting in Las Vegas as well. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the victims, their families, and their loved ones. I also want to thank the law enforcement officers and first responders who bravely rushed to the scene and attended to the victims. While we are still learning the details of this tragic event, it is a sobering reminder of the harm a single actor can cause when he has violent intent, intent and access to deadly weapons. Sunday's attack comes a little more than a year after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. Until Sunday, the Pulse attack was the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history. Lieutenant Smith, I understand you were part of the law enforcement response to that shooting, and I thank you for your service. While it may not be the stated topic of this hearing, considering recent events and the renewed urgency to take up comprehensive gun safety reform, Lieutenant Smith, I hope that we can hear from you today on some of the lessons you learned from that tragic experience and some of the suggestions you have for my colleagues here in Congress on what we can do to address this ep epidemic of gun violence. While we may never know what drove the killer to indiscriminately fire upon concert goers, what is undeniable is that it terrorized innocent law-abiding citizens. Congress has an obligation to pass common sense gun control reforms to reduce reduce the lethality of future attacks. As a ranking member of the Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Service, I am all too familiar with the diverse security threats on our nation faces. While this shooting shows that any large gathering can be targeted for attack, terrorists continue to place particular importance on attacking transportation systems. Soft targets such as subways, mass transit stations, and public airport areas have been targeted in the United States and abroad. Securing these critical transportation systems requires a layered, risk-based approach. While no one technology or solution can provide unbeatable scrutiny, security, canines have proven to be one of the most effective tools for securing large venues open to the public. Under the Obama administration, the TSA more than doubled the size of its canine program, growing from the number of canine teams from 518 in 2008 to 1047 in 2017. 
At my home airport of Newark uh, Liberty International Airport, TSA now deploys 13 canines to support their operations. TSA provides an additional 20 canines to the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey for deployment at all of its transportation systems. Although I have been pleased by the continued investment in canines, I must note that they have been deployed disproportionately to securing aviation compared to other transportation sectors. TSA devotes more attention and resources to aviation than service transportation in general. Many of the TSA's technologies that are in use at airport security checkpoints cannot be effectively integrated into bustling train stations and other active surface transportation venues. However, canines are mobile and able to detect explosives both on persons and in baggage. They work well in crowds and they can be trained to detect evolving threats. There is also some evidence that they serve as a deterrent to those who may be planning an attack. TSA must devote more of its resources to securing surface transportation systems, particularly in light of AQAP's publication of its latest issue of Inspire magazine last August, which encouraged and provided instructions for attacks against U.S. railways. Ensuring that there are dedicated canine resources available to help secure high-risk surface transportation would be a perfect place to start. To that end, I will be introducing a bill to revamp and invest in surface transportation security programs in the near future, and I hope my colleagues will give it their support. Again, thank you to the witnesses for appearing here today, and I look forward to learning more about the capabilities and the contributions of canines to our national security. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank the gentlewoman. Um, I'm pleased to um, introduce our witnesses, uh, Ms. Sheila Goff, Vice President of Government Relations for the American Kennel Club, Lieutenant Scott Smith of the Orlando, Florida Police Department, and Dr. Cynthia Otto, Executive Director of the Penn Vet Working Dog Center at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. Welcome to you all. Pursuant to Oversight Committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Uh, the record will reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, you may be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. As a reminder, uh, turn on your microphones uh, when, when you are testifying. Uh, the clock in front of you shows you your remaining time for giving your testimony. The light will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds left and red when your time is up, and then the gavel will remind you that the light turned red. Um, I'd like to recognize the witnesses for their testimony. Uh, Ms. Goff, if, if you would. Thank you. Chairman Palmer, Chairman Katko, Ranking Member Demings, and Watson Coleman, and other distinguished guests, it's a pleasure to be here in Washington today. And on behalf of the American Kennel Club, I thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of our concerns and experiences with, with respect to the need, demand for, and use of military working dogs, particularly explosives detection dogs, in ways that improving the domestic sourcing of detection dogs can help protect our national security. The American Kennel Club was founded in 1884 by a group of sportsmen and dog enthusiasts who wished to record and preserve the bloodlines of their working dogs and advance the capabilities for future generations. Today, more than 130 years later, the AKC remains dedicated to protecting and advancing the unique capabilities of purpose-bred dogs as part of our mission of promoting purebred dogs and thoughtful, purposeful breeding for type and function. The AKC is a not-for-profit organization and national club of more than 5,000 member and affiliated clubs around the country. In 2016, AKC sanctioned 22,000 dog-related events throughout the country in disciplines ranging from confirmation dog shows to field trials, agility, and obedience. Earlier this year, we established a competitive sport based on scent detection. AKC is also the largest all-breed registry in the world. We are dedicated to advocating for the purebred dog as a working and family companion, advocating for canine health and well-being, advancing the study and breeding of purebred dogs, and promoting responsible dog ownership. We have a long history of helping the government with military working dog programs. 
In World War II, some 17,000 AKC registered dogs served in the Dogs for Defense program. In the last decade, AKC board member Carmen Battaglia has been an advisor to the TSA breeding program at Lackland Air Force Base, providing expertise on breeding strategies and puppy raising protocols, such as early neurological stimulation to improve long-term outcomes for successful military working dogs. Over the course of this interaction, AKC was asked how we might be able to assist with the development and procurement of quality, domestically bred dogs suitable for training as military working dogs. The AKC does not sell dogs, nor do we seek to become a government contractor. The AKC brings a breadth of knowledge, a large network of breeders, and the expertise and ability to facilitate among a range of stakeholders. We see our role as a facilitator who can provide expertise and information to breeders to bring them together with cutting edge research in agencies that need very specific types of dogs that can succeed as military working dogs. As mentioned earlier, military working dogs play a critical role in our national security. According to sources within and outside the federal government, 80 to 90 percent of the dogs purchased by the Homeland Security and Department of Defense come from foreign sources. As Americans, we should be concerned that an extraordinarily high percentage of the dogs that serve on the front lines of protecting the public our public institutions and our national security are obtained from foreign sources. About a year ago, AKC formed a team to gather information about American use and procurement of explosive detection dogs, the challenges faced in having enough fully trained, deployable dogs to meet demand, and how changes in breeding and procurement might improve outcomes. We met with officials at the Department of Defense, the TSA, private vendors, government and private contractors, academia, and law enforcement. We found a range of concerns regarding an over-reliance on foreign bred and procured dogs, a lack of transparency and consistency in the selection process for untrained or green dogs. We found high failure rates among both foreign and domestic dogs and procurement processes that intimidated potential suppliers and could favor foreign dogs over domestically bred dogs. We also heard concerns that outcomes from scientific research on improving performance and efficiency within our training programs were not being implemented consistently. In March, AKC hosted the U.S. Dog Detection Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. The conference assembled key stakeholders from government, academia, the private sector to discuss ways that AKC could provide dogs to protect the safety and security of the United States and advance the concept of a working dog center of excellence. We plan to make this conference an annual event and would like to extend an invitation to the conference and to members of the House Homeland Security and Oversight and Government Reform Committees and appropriate staff to attend our next conference. At this conference, and I know Dr. Cindy Otto will also speak about this, um, we looked at a number of challenges and a number of opportunities. We looked at ways that we could come together to provide the expertise the knowledge, the training, the cutting edge science, all together as part of a center for canine excellence for working dogs. We plan to continue to work towards that future and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have about the specifics of the plans to bring together this expertise and the ways that we would like to be able to assist in this process. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes Lieutenant Smith for his testimony. Thank you, Chairman Palmer. And I'd also like to thank the members of the subcommittees for inviting me here today, and specifically Ranking Member Demings. Um, the connection is not lost on me why I'm sitting here in front of you. Um, my name is Scott Smith. I'm a lieutenant with the Orlando Police Department. I've been in law enforcement for 25 years, all of which have been done in Orlando, Florida. Um, throughout the years, I've had an opportunity to hold a variety of jobs within our agency, but by far the most rewarding and the most, most challenging has been supervising the canine unit. Um, I'd like to take the next couple of minutes to explain to you our uses of canine in Orlando and also explain a couple of <clears throat> unique security concerns in the Central Florida region and how we address those with the canines. Um, the Orlando Police Department utilizes 14 full-service canines in their day-to-day -day operations. These full-service canines are primarily used to support patrol personnel in search and apprehension of criminals. They are trained and tested in disciplines such as area searches, building searches, tracking, and apprehension. 
In addition to the above functions, each of these canines also possess a secondary specialty and are trained in either narcotics detection or explosive detection. Over the years, as the paradigm has shifted from a war on drugs to a war on terror, so too has our focus on secondary specialties. <clears throat> in the early years of our program, almost all of our canines were, chained, were trained on narcotics detection. Now, in the aftermath of such events as the 93 World Trade Center bombing, the Manchester Arena bombing, Brussels Airport, and the coordinated terrorist attacks in Paris, France that used num numerous suicide vests, <clears throat> the Orlando Police Department Canine Unit concentrates heavily on the explosive detection specialty. In addition to the 14 full-service canines that I mentioned above, the Orlando Police Department also utilizes four single-purpose explosive detection dogs. These four canines are only trained on explosive order and odor and were specifically purchased to bolster the security measures at Orlando International Airport. They maintain a visible presence throughout the airport and actively sweep passengers in common landside areas such as ticketing, baggage claim, and the food and retail areas. As has been demonstrated in past terror events, whether it's ISIS or a lone extremist, mass transit facilities such as an international airport are a favorite target. It can shut down an entire transit system as well as ensure a large amount of casualties. Due to the unique tourism industry of Central Florida, Orlando, Orlando International Airport has continued to grow and has set daily passenger records throughout 2017. In addition, the Orlando International Airport is currently in phase one of a brand new international terminal scheduled to open in 2020. With the expansion of the airport and the increased passenger numbers it will bring, the demand for security screenings will only increase. Local and federal agencies will be forced to grow in order to support these security demands. By utilizing canine assets, agencies can offset man manpower demands and screen a wider number of people faster. In addition to our international airport, Central Florida is home to several of the top tourist destinations in the world. For the past three years, the Central Florida region has surpassed its tourist numbers from 62 million in 2014 to 68 million in 2016. On a daily basis, local law enforcement canine teams are patrolling theme parks such as Walt Disney World, Universal Studios, and SeaWorld. And at times, a particular theme park can register as many as a quarter of a million guests in their parks at one town. Due to these numbers, some of these theme parks even supplement the law enforcement explosive detection teams with their own supply of explosive detection canines. And although these personnel are not sworn law enforcement, it enables the theme parks to show a greater presence and screen a greater number of visitors at their turnstiles. On top of the concentration of theme parks in Central Florida, Orlando is also a host to a number of collegiate and professional athletic events. Our explosive detection dogs sweep 41 home games for the Orlando Magic, 19 home games for Orlando City Soccer, 12 for Orlando Pride, plus three NCAA Bowl games. Orlando is also currently the host city for the NFL Pro Bowl. Attendance at these games can range from 5,000 to 70,000. Numbers like those seen at theme parks and sporting events are often too tempting to ignore for an extremist or an individual. The visible presence and active screening of canine teams at choke points at these venues is an invaluable deterrence to the safety of the visitors. Lastly, as everyone knows, on June 12, 2016, Orlando fell victim to the largest terrorist attack on U.S. soil since 9-11. A self-radicalized extremist murdered 49 victims at a small nightclub just outside downtown Orlando. The terrorist boldly made claims of possessing suicide vests as well as having a car bomb parked outside. <clears throat> Several canine teams from different agencies across Central Florida responded to that event. The, sus the suspect's car was swept as well as key areas around, night around the nightclub such as command posts, staging areas, and ultimately sorry, excuse me, and staging areas. Ultimately, his claims of explosives proved to be false, but the use of responding canine teams helped alleviate the concerns of first responders about secondary devices and allowed them to concentrate on the terrorist himself. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize the ever-changing tactics used by extremist groups who frequently seek out soft targets with large number of victims. The threat to these targets can be greatly mitigated by the use of explosive detection canines. The simple sight of a canine vehicle or a canine team patrolling a choke point can deter even the most dedicated terrorists if they believe they will be detected before they can cause the greatest amount of damage. Those that seek to harm us need to know we will use the best assets available to prevent their attacks and preserve life. Again, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak in front of you and I look forward to answering any questions.
Thank the gentleman for his testimony. The chair recognizes Dr. Otto for her testimony. Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Demings, Chairman Katko, uh, Ranking Member Watson Coleman, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Penn Vet Working Dog Center is the nation's premier research and educational facility dedicated to harnessing the unique strengths of our canine partners and producing an elite group of scent detection dogs for public health and safety. The Working Dog Center is a living laboratory where we study and test strategies to optimize canine health and performance from eight weeks of age through career entry. Early training provides a positive learning environment and mitigates problems. This, combined with placing dogs in their chosen careers, ranging from explosive detection to cancer detection, has resulted in 93% of our dogs graduating into detection careers. Dogs are a force multiplier. Dogs are diverse in their skills and applications in which dogs support national security directly and indirectly are constantly expanding. The most obvious direct applications are the explosive detection canine and the law enforcement canine. Many of the other jobs, such as narcotics detection, agriculture, search and rescue, human remains detection, and even conservation dogs, indirectly support national security. The demand for working dogs in other fields is also great. Dogs that could serve in national security careers may instead be sold to organizations or individuals that utilize dogs for other detection roles, hunting, or sport. Overall, there is a great and increasing demand for dogs with the health, behaviors, and skills necessary for a wide array of working careers, and currently, there is no comprehensive plan to increase the supply of these invaluable canines or conduct the research to enhance their success. With the high demand for dogs, one of the challenges faced is the affordable procurement of healthy dogs capable of performing the tasks required. In seeking a solution, we must consider the cost of the dogs and the source of the dogs. There are several components that contribute to the cost of a dog. The first is in identifying dogs for potential purchase. The purchase price of both successful dogs and those that eventually fail must also be tracked. Once a dog is acquired, the expense of training, medical care, housing, transportation, and working lifespan of the dog should be included. Finally, one of the biggest factors in the cost of the working dog is the cost of the human partner. In summary, the initial price of the dog is a small fraction of the total cost of employing a detection canine. Wise choices on the health and training of the dogs and selection of the handler can help to reduce the lifetime costs of dogs. The main options for sourcing dogs are imports, domestic breeders, shelter dogs, or a dedicated breeding program. Traditionally, the majority of dogs for the U.S. military and domestic law enforcement agencies have been imported. Challenges with imports stem from a lack of control over genetics, health, environment, and availability. The current challenge with relying on domestic breeders is production of top hunting dogs is typically their primary goal. Thus, cost and selection criteria often don't align with government needs. A shelter model is emotionally appealing but limited by cost and availability of appropriate dogs, making it unsuitable as a primary source of dogs. A dedicated breeding program would allow for control of genetics, environment, and training, and potentially meet the demands for dogs in a variety of careers. Development of a breeding cooperative would allow breeders and organizations to sell dogs that meet the health, behavioral, and genetic requirements. For this program to be effective, additional and ongoing research will be necessary. In conclusion, to improve the availability and success of working dogs, supporting our national security in an efficient and cost-effective manner, sound scientific principles must be applied to all aspects of dog selection, training, and deployment. To achieve the full potential of federally hosted collaboration between academic institutions, government agencies, organizations, breeders, and industry to create a National Detection Dog Center of Excellence is critical. The Center of Excellence would research, validate, and disseminate best practices 
to advance the scientific approach to dog selection, care, and training. Furthermore, to address the impending crisis of detection dog availability, a new cooperative model of detection dog breeding, early training, and distribution must be critically evaluated. Included in the documents is a white paper describing a cooperative breeding program that we presented at the AKC um, summit last um, March. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to pr present and welcome your questions and comments. I thank the witnesses for their testimony. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Goff, when, I was, when you were speaking, you reminded me of one of my early jobs as a young teenager working at AKC events in the central New York area. I was excited to go work with dogs until I got there and found out what the job was. Uh, wearing your white, uh, white coat and a large shovel and a big bucket, you can guess what I had to do all day, every day. But uh, it was, it was uh, I, it's an early exposure to AKC and the professionalism of, them, professionalism of the organization, and I'm impressed with that. Dr. Otto, your, uh, your testimony was, was excellent, and it was very helpful because uh, we do need a blueprint, and I think we all agree that uh, increasing the use of canines in law enforcement and anti-terror efforts is preferable over fancy new machines that rarely work as advertised. And uh, they are more pliable, more... Um, able to adapt and uh, cost effective as well. So I don't think there's an argument about that. The question is why aren't we getting there? And you both touched on it. But I think one of the big things that I'm concerned with is some of the bottlenecks and some of the inconsistencies and some of the sheer incompetence in the procurement process. We see that again and again in Homeland Security uh, in other areas, but the procurement process with, with respect to the dogs provides a disincentive for breeders to uh, get into this field. So we gotta fix that, and I'd like to hear from you about that. And then if there's anything you'd like to drill down on with respect to your te testimony, Dr. Otto, I'd like to hear that. So Ms. Goff, if you wanna expound on the procurement process for me first, that'd be helpful. Absolutely, thank you. Um, to start with, for the procurement process, um, we have been looking at the opportunity to acquaint and bring many of the breeders in our network into this process. Uh, one of the issues that we've had is uh, several fold. One, we have many, many small breeders throughout the country who provide the types of dogs that would potentially be ideal for this process, but they don't breed a lot of dogs. They do breed high quality dogs, so they don't necessarily have the resources. Uh, they can be intimidated in some cases by the government contracting process. Um, as you know, the government contracting process um, has historically looked for large quantities of dogs. And one of the ways that we think we can help address this problem is to make some changes in the processing uh, or the contract process uh, program so that small breeders potentially working can, together can actually provide um, dogs that are needed, the type of dogs that are needed. Another comment that we heard uh, was from some vendors around the country who had mentioned that in order to scale up, to develop the types of dogs with the, the health protocols, you know, the, the, the scientific background, looking at the genetics of the dog, looking at the pedigrees of the dog, making sure that these dogs were, were healthy physically and mentally, able to stand up to the rigors of day on, day off in various types of conditions out there uh, sniffing for, for explosives, that they needed a, a larger facility, a strong breeding program. Unfortunately, what they found was that small business set-asides got in the way of their ability to do that. When they expanded to a certain level to have the expertise that they needed uh, to scale up, if you will, they were no longer a small business. Um, that has also brought forward the question of, when you consider that detection canines are a critical national security resource, should they potentially be um, identified under a different NAIS code? Currently, they're identified as live animals, which would be the same as any other animal in acquisition processes, but these animals are different. They are a key part of national security so that the people who are providing them very well may need to have a different level of uh, category for what constitutes a small business. 
Uh, Mr. Goff, uh, just to follow up on that, and Dr. Otto, I think I'll have to ask for your, your response in writing, if you would, because I'm going to run out of time if it's not covered later in the hearing. But um, uh, just a question for you, Ms. Goff, to follow up on what you were saying. Uh, do you find that different agencies have different standards, and, and is, does that contribute to the problem? We have, uh, yeah, we've interviewed a number of people, and we have found that there have been, uh, has been a lot of inconsistency uh, actually within and across agencies. Uh, there has been some frustration among people who would like to provide dogs that they have uh, bred, provided the dogs, gone down in many cases to Lackland or somewhere where the dogs would be evaluated, and um, they have not had a, cons a consistent, consistent testing experience. The concerns have involved uh, cons uh, complaints that the protocols used were not realistic to the needs of what that dog would actually be um, expected to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we've also heard that um, they were rejected without a full explanation. And part of the concern of this is we understand, you know, not all dogs are going to make it. These are very, very specialized dogs. But we think to, to advance the knowledge and the learning and our ability to really have good detection dogs, we're going to want to have feedback from the federal agency so we can work together, make sure that our breeders know exactly what it is that is required in what is considered to be an untrained dog. So we're not talking about high-level security, high-level training. We're talking about basic training for these dogs, just socialization, uh, environmental stability, uh, the mental and physical capabilities to do what they need to do on a daily basis. And we, we are hearing that the, the evaluations have been inconsistent. It's true that some of this is subjective. You've, you've heard the old comment that if you have three trainers in a room, two of them will agree that the other one is doing something wrong. But from the perspective of science, and national security. We think that part of what a Center for Excellence can do is to establish standards that are a baseline that every dog, every green dog, should be able to accomplish to make it to that first level of being accepted into a training program. And then you can carry on with um, additional training. Thank you, Mr. Goff. Uh, I have many other questions, but my time has expired, so I yield back. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for his questions. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, uh, the general lady from Florida, Ms. Demings, for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, to our witnesses, thank you all for being here. Lieutenant Smith, it's good to see you again. And I will start uh, with you. Could you please again for us just talk about the critical role that canines play in the safety of the traveling public? And then if you would also talk a bit about uh, where the Orlando Police Department procures its canines, and if you've seen any difference between U.S. Uh, dogs from the U.S. versus dogs from other places like Europe. Yes, ma'am. As far as um, our use in Orlando, um, like I addressed in my opening statement, um, the Orlando International Airport, um, we just procured those four single-purpose dogs, so that's a new program from us, and uh, that, I know there's a trademark here somewhere, but it's a vapor wake terminology is what those dogs were. Um, so that's, that's a new training, new technique. Um, the other 14 dogs that I talked about, uh, they are used throughout the city in different venues to include those arenas or sporting complexes. Um, and in downtown Orlando, you obviously know the Dr. Phillips Center, Performing Arts Center, um, a lot of the, the vigils that we have or the large um, you know, runs or Lake Eola type thing, Fourth of July celebrations, anywhere that's gonna draw thousands of people, we will use those dogs in a pre-sweep. Um, and I think that's very important. People walk by, it's the same as, as Jack's over here. Everybody walks in and they recognize the canine. Um, they see it right away. Uh, I think they see, you know, the uniform, if it says canine on there, and I addressed it earlier about a vehicle, when you park a vehicle in front of someplace like an airport terminal or something like that, and it has canine in red, that's a deterrent. You know, whether or not that canine's right there, if somebody drives up and they see that, they're gonna think twice, whether it's a pre-surveillance thing, an intelligence gathering thing, you know, unfortunately it will only displace it, it may not prevent it in, uh, entirely, but when they see it, they may pick something else besides the large scale mass casualty place. Um, 
the other part of your question was? Procurement. Procurement. Um, for our full service dogs, we go through third party vendors. Um, they're kind of, once you find a good one, you wanna keep your hands on them. Um, we have gone through a few vendors over the years that I've been there, and I'm sure yourself, um, you'll get a couple of good dogs, and then after that, the quality kind of deteriorates. You know, the, the quantity is definitely there, the dogs are there, um, but it is the quality. When the use of military working dogs and police working dogs really took off, um, we saw a decline in the age of the dogs that we were getting as a local agency. Um, I think a lot of them were being used in the military and those vendors chose to sell to them first and then some of the dogs that we got were instead of being two two and a half they started to be a year and a half old or maybe just a little older and you start to get too young and then you run the risk of actually breaking the dog you know the socialization and the hard work and stuff um, they won't respond to the discipline that you put on them so okay thank you uh, dr. Otto first of all I want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing through your uh, nonprofit uh, would you agree that many federal agencies use highly trained dogs for a variety of missions? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that we need to consider is that we're not just selecting for one type of dog. So there may be different criteria for different agencies because they have diff different missions. And, and one of the really important things about a National Center of Excellence is that we can consider the phenotype, which is that external expression of the behavior, and associate that with the genotype, which is the genetic underpinnings, and we can start to actually select dogs for the jobs that we need them to be in, and if we have a litter of puppies, we know they're not all gonna be identical. And so there may be some dogs that do wonderful passenger screening and others that do person-born explosives and some that might actually just need to go to another agency that is looking for um, support dogs for uh, veterans with PTSD. Do you know if agencies have developed test standards for their canine units uh, that vary according to the mission? I don't know specifically. I know that one of our big missions is to actually collect the data because people don't quantitatively evaluate those characteristics. A lot of people will take a test that another organization has used, whether it's relevant or not. Um, and one of our big research questions is, what's the appropriate test, what's the screening that best predicts success in the field that those dogs will end up working in? Thank you so much, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my first question is for, for Dr. Otto. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about is the acceptance rate of U.S. bred dogs is much lower than, than uh, some of the dogs secured from uh, overseas, particularly Europe. What are some of the best practices that we can put in place to help improve that acceptance rate? Um, first, I think we have to define the acceptance rate. I think a lot of people are screening dogs looking for specific things, and, and we're not breeding those dogs or preparing those dogs for jobs um, in the government. So I think that's the first place that we need to go. Um, and I think that if we're starting to look at what the jobs are, and again, looking at those expectations, that phenotype, we can really impact the dogs early on. In our program, we start training our dogs at eight weeks of age. Um, and as a result of that, we're able to mitigate a lot of problems that are things that are keeping dogs from being successful, like environmental sensitivity. So from the time our dogs are eight weeks, they're going on linoleum floors, they're climbing metal stairs, they're used to these environments, they're able to actually enter the workforce at 12 to 18 months. We're also using positive reinforcement training, so that is a really important factor in allowing these dogs, when they are young, um, to be successful in these pretty intense careers, as long as they're loving what they're doing, it really is something that, that they are, are thriving at. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Goff, you, you, um, we talked about the government procurement process, and that was one of the, one of the questions you were asked. You know, are, are there improvements that we can use in identifying our, our standards that we need to, uh, to acquire to and, and from, and, and what, are, what are some things that we can do in that regards? 
Yes, I, th I think there, there are some improvements. Um, and I'd also just like to say, I think one of the areas that we can improve is that when we're currently obtaining dogs from overseas, we're getting them at 12 months of age. Um, and to Dr. Otto's point and to several other points, when we get them at 12 months of age, they then go into a training program almost immediately. Um, one of the things that we find to be interesting is that, you know, most breeders already let their dogs go at about 12 weeks. So there's this long period of time that for the dogs that we're you know, obtaining overseas, we don't know what's happening in that period of time. It's one of the challenges that we face, but potentially by getting more and working more to breed more dogs in the United States, we're gonna have a better oversight of what's happening in that period of time, and that means better training, better socialization, to your other question, also potentially increasing the success rate because it's not what you're picking up at 12 months, like what you're picking up overseas. We're getting a dog that is, that we, what we see is what we get at 12 months, but rather one that we can actually prepare for a much longer period of time to bringing, you know, to bringing that into the system. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the rank, uh, our ranking committee uh, member, uh, Mrs. Watson Coleman from New Jersey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a breeder typically, I'm going to talk about a breeder in this country. A breeder typically holds on to the dog um, and then will allow the dog to be purchased at what age? Is it eight weeks, 12 weeks? Uh, yes, uh, typically, and of course it varies, but uh, most breeders who are going to let a dog go, let it go at about eight to 12 weeks of age, um, getting it to its new home to start socialization and training at that point. Thank you. So, Lieutenant Smith, if the breeder is letting the dog become available between eight and 12 weeks, do you purchase the dog at that age and then engage in a year's worth of training? What happens in between? What happens before, between the time that the breeder has a dog that's eligible to be purchased and you, the, the end user, actually gets it? We may have to answer this jointly, but from our end, the, the breeders, and unfortunately we do typically get ours from Europe, um, through a third-party vendor. Um, so the breeder is obviously in Europe. They're raising it from a puppy up until probably about a year is when the vendor from you know, Florida, the state of Florida is typically taking a trip to Europe. The dog's gonna be about a year old. Vendors have certain tests that they will conduct with the breeders over there, whether or not they wanna purchase it. You know, unfortunately, some of the third party vendors are like used car salesmen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they want to bring in as many dogs as they can and get rid of them as fast as they can. Um, and some of their testing programs, you know, they'll bring in dogs that, that don't meet standards for local law enforcement. So um, then we'll go through the vendor and we run our own series of tests to see if it's a dog that we would want to employ. And do you, then do your dogs get recertified? They get, they get certified in a particular detection or whatever, and then do they get recertified? If so, how often? Correct. Um, so full purpose dogs, those 14 that I talked about, and you know, they, have a, they have a larger job. Um, so that is standardized by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and that's 480 hours of training. And that covers all those areas that I talked about, building searches, area searches, tracking, apprehension. Um, any odor work after that, narcotics or explosive, is another 160. So, you know, manpower-wise, um, Dr. Otto touched on the, on the cost for the handler themselves being in training that long. You know, it's, it's probably about four to five months before, okay. once we get the dog and that handler is on the street with that team. Okay. So, Ms. Goff, tell me this. What needs to be done so that a breeder would hold on, a breeder interested in having the dog purchased for security purposes? What would need to be done to uh, make that happen? Right, yeah, uh, great question. Um, there are a couple of things we can do. Um, one of the things we'd suggest is looking at the incentives currently. Um, what we're dealing with, with a lot of the really wonderful uh, hunting field trail dogs that we would normally be looking at, um, one of the problems is that a breeder can sell them um, at 12 weeks for a comparable price that the government will pay at 12 months. 
breeder will say, well, you know, I can hold this dog for another year, feed it, you know, train it, medical care, et cetera, and maybe the government will want it. Or I, I can sell it to this great home down the street that's going to pay the same price. So unfortunately, we, we have a rather um, have a disincentive for breeders to be selling to the government. Having said that, we do, we have, AKC has reached out and we do know people are interested in doing this. Uh, one of the things that we, we think is a, is a critical need, um, and this goes to your point earlier, of what do we do in that year? What happens with the foreign dogs? We don't know what happens with the foreign dogs in that period from 12 weeks to one year. But with US dogs, um, there are several programs out there that have um, developed um, relationships with prisons. So you have some prison, prison socialization and training. We found those to be very, very successful. Um, Dr. Otto's program has well, developed I was that socialization. Ask Dr. Otto yep. yeah, about a response to this question mm -hmm. as well. If you don't mind. I was uh, dying to tell you. <laughs> I couldn't tell that. <laughs> please ask me, please ask me. It's really, and that, for, at the beginning, that was really our big challenge. We figured we could get breeders to breed and then sell puppies at 8 to 12 weeks. We knew we had people who wanted dogs at a year to 18 months. And so our big challenge was what happens in that, that time period. And the Penn Vet Working Dog Center has really been an experiment in what we can do. And we found that it is so valuable to be able to have those dogs. And our dogs come every day to school and are trained and then go home and live with foster families. Um, and so those dogs are able to be tweaked and adjusted and remedial efforts and, and everything, which is why we think they're so successful. But it's also very labor intensive. And, and one of our goals is to look at what the cost effectiveness of maybe a prison program, but also maybe a partial prison program, because we know the dogs in the prison programs don't get the environmental exposure that sometimes we need. So some sort of melding of that. There may be kennel programs. There may be a lot of things that we have to research and ask the question, what's the most effective? What is the most cost effective and also training wise? But I think what we've missed out in so many of these programs is this early childhood development and our ability to really influence the dogs and set them up for success. Thank you. Thank you. My time is up. I yield back. I thank the gentlewoman. The chair now recognizes my colleague from Alabama, uh, Congressman Rogers, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Palmer. I want to thank you and Chairman Katko for calling this very important hearing. This is a subject that needs a lot more uh, discussion and, uh, and uh, prominence with the public because I don't think the public understands how scarce this resource is and how critically important it is to our national security. Uh, Lieutenant Smith, I didn't, I didn't hear you say where you procured the 14 canines from. Uh, where are they sourced from? Typically, we've found um, several third-party vendors throughout the state of Florida. Um, we're currently using one in Miami, Florida right now. We have a local one in New Smyrna Beach. And then we've also used one in the Panhandle near Tallahassee. But again, all those vendors take their trips overseas, pick out their dogs, and bring them back. So, so they're procuring them from overseas as well? Correct. Okay, they're just, okay. Uh, Dr. Otto, you know, one of the things that, that I have been advocating for in, re in recent years uh, is that we put more emphasis on domestic breeding uh, with the understanding that this would be a subsidized venture by the federal government with us getting first choice uh, of the, uh, the product. Uh, why do you think that hasn't happened as we've, as we've pushed for this? Why do you think that the, the universities and, and the, 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 the marketplace have not formed a consortium to develop this breeding capacity domestically? I think it's a great question, and I think that timing is a lot, and the fact that a lot of the agencies weren't talking to each other and breeders weren't talking, and this whole meeting that the AKC hosted was such a great revelation of getting all of the people in the same room so that we could have this discussion and come to the realization that we all need to work together. Um, and I think having a center of excellence to kind of coordinate it, because to be successful, we're going to need a breeding co-op. And a breeding co-op means that we don't have a centralized breeding source, but we have a mechanism to bring all these individuals in together to study it, collect data, um, look at the different programs of how to raise the dogs from that eight weeks to the 12 months, and then 
I call it working dog finder, um, which is like puppy finder, where you actually have the organizations come in and say, I need a dog that does this, this, and this, and the, the consortium, the, the co-op has dogs that then they can match up so that we can actually funnel things. I think one of our challenges has been that, that we've been very narrow. It's like, I only want to work with explosive detection dogs. Well, we know that not every dog is going to be successful in that realm, so we want to make sure that we bring in everybody. Yeah, well, I will, I, you know, the way I envision this, and I, and I see the VaporWake explosive detection canines as, as the, the top tier, the, the Cadillac of, of explosive detections, and then you got the passenger screening canines underneath that. But in, in my experience, and I've been doing this a long time dealing with this topic, uh, that even if a dog is not capable of uh, those two careers, they can always drop down and be used on the border for drug detection and, and gun detection because the, the Customs and Border Protection are getting dogs from, from uh, the local pound uh, for that. So I don't see that there'd be any waste in, in, in a breeding program uh, that, we, that we constructed. But we've, um, what I hear re repeatedly is, well, the reason why it hasn't happened by the private sector is the business, business case doesn't close. Uh, well, I just think that's because we haven't developed the state-of-the-art dog that, that we can produce in this country, which brings me to, to my question. Uh, my understanding is that there really isn't a, uh, a collection of, of information about these different breeders, the lines that they've developed uh, to, uh, that are, that's being centralized for researchers like you uh, to, to study. Uh, is that accurate or am I wrong? That is accurate. We are certainly working, and again, we're looking at even the genetics, but until we can have that quantitative phenotype, so in other words, we can tell specifically, numerically, what those traits are that we're looking for, it's really hard to look at the genetics and say we should breed this dog to this dog. The International Working Dog Breeding Association has come up with an incredible um, uh, program where people can put in that information and learn what they call estimated breeding values so we can make good selection uh, based on those criteria. And that's what's going to move things forward. We know the TSA breeding program made incredible genetic advances over the 10 years that they were there. Um, and that is the kind of thing that we need to be doing, but we need to be collecting the science. We need to have those, those markers, and we need to know what the genetics is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. If, if, if uh, you don't mind, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that I uh, submit my remaining questions to be provided to the witnesses for them to answer for the record. We are going to have a second round. Uh, Good. If, if you would like to ask those questions, you may do so, or, or we will we'll put them in the record. I, I'll wait for the second round. I, I can ask questions longer than they'll put, put up with me. <laughs> Uh, with that, I will now recognize myself for uh, five minutes, and there will be a second round of, of questions. Um, Ms. Goff, one of the issues that, that prevents increased utilization of domestically bred dogs is, is the age at which the agencies are able to accept them. Um, for many breeders, that, it, that doesn't make sense to hold on to a dog past eight or, or 12 weeks when they are typically sent to their new homes for, for training. Would, um, uh, particularly for um, detect, uh, training for detection or pasture screening. Can, can you discuss uh, what, if any, steps the American Kennel Club is, is taking to try to uh, bridge that gap? Uh, several. Um, a couple of the things that we have looked at in addition to the aforementioned prison programs, um, working with some of the universities who are doing the ongoing training, um, doing a great job of that, is really working with our breeders to convince them to sign on to a program where the dogs that they are producing um, will be developed for this purpose, and so they are taking a, a longer-term look at the puppy, uh, particularly if the people who have you know a lot of family members who can help out with the socialization. You know, dog breeding is very much in many parts of the country still a very much a family a family operation. So really holding on to them longer, and then what we envision is making sure that they have all of the knowledge, the science, the research they need to make those dogs as strong as possible. Um, and part of that is 
by letting the government know, developing some kind of relationship where because you are able to provide a more stable, a uh, dog that's a lot more training time behind it, you're gonna have a more greater success, we hope, with getting into the government program. So it's not a concern, that disincentive of I should sell the dog at 12 weeks rather than waiting for 12 months. Uh, that's one of the options. Um, also, our kennel clubs may provide additional options. Um, and then finally, uh, we do have some, uh, a lot of dedicated fanciers, ex-breeders, who have rather aged out of breeding, but they're still very, very engaged with the dogs. These also present wonderful people to hold on to a puppy, to be pup, you know, puppy foster parents, if you will, for a year or so and really train them, socialize them, and sort of give back. You said something earlier about a business model and, and that we, we don't have a business model for that, uh, without going into a, a long, long answer, mm -hmm. I, I would be interested to know what that business model would look like. And, and it seems, in listening to your answer then, that uh, that's one of the, the gaps that we have in, in getting the dogs that, that need to be trained for the kind of work that Lieutenant Smith does, that TSA needs done, <laughs> our, law, our armed services. Uh, do you, is there a business model that, that you guys have come up with? We think a lot of it is about financial incentive as well, frankly, the ability to do this and to make a living at doing this. Uh, and one of the concerns that we've had with, with the dogs that have been procured overseas is while the government says that those dogs are cheaper, one of the things that has not been fully investigated is are they in fact cheaper? And is the government able or paying what we should be paying for these highly valuable resources. It may be a case that, that the, the going rate for these dogs should be higher, particularly when you consider and you compare what we'd be paying at 12 weeks for a puppy versus 12 months and compare what we're paying to sustain overseas buying trips um, and all the additional costs that go along with foreign purchase versus domestic purchase. So, so we are actually very supportive of some language of, of Mr. Rogers and the Defense Authorization Act that investigates the differences in the costs and tries to set a, a more realistic cost um, for, for purchasing puppies at a later date with a ready to go. I'm glad we're going to do a second round because I'm going to continue to ask you along this line, and I've got questions for Lieutenant Smith and, and Dr. Otto. Um, and unlike some chairman, I won't take 10 minutes for five, so um, not calling any names. But uh, um, if we had a different model where we kept these dogs longer so that they're, they're an appropriate age for this type of training and they didn't measure up, would those animals still be, and, and Dr. Otto, you can answer this, would those animals still be appropriate for a family to adopt or, or even be sold? Because most of these dogs are purebred, aren't they? Uh, that, that you could still have a market for that so that you create a business model where if the dog doesn't pan out for service with Lieutenant Smith, the dog could, would still be a, a viable product that someone, someone else might be interested in. I can tell you that the list of people who want dogs that don't make it in our program is really long. And because we've had very few dogs that don't make it, we, we can't even accommodate that. So there are definitely people who are interested. But also using the model where we can have the dogs, if they're not successful in this program, could they be successful in another? So again, defining that phenotype for each and every one of these programs that's using dogs, um, we can have dogs successful in a whole array of different careers, um, and then those that aren't successful are, are going to be very uh, attractive to people who maybe want to compete in sport or just really want a, a pet. Although a lot of these dogs are pretty high energy, so they're not your average pet, um, but they still are, are very, um, very appealing. Well, what my, my point is, it's not necessarily as a pet, but are they marketable? Because in, you know, what you have here is an overhead cost. And a, and a business is trying to reduce its overhead. So if it's got a, a primary product that um, has a high spoilage rate, for instance, it's a, the overhead's higher. But if there's a market for these dogs, that, and, and as uh, Congressman Rogers pointed out, uh, and we make this um, from a, a, a price point worthwhile, it seems to me that, that there is a business model that could be developed that, that would make this work. 
Uh, we will now begin the second round of questions. I will recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I stand ready and willing to take any dogs that you might be available, because we have plenty of room in our yard. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, Lieutenant Smith, I want to talk to you a little bit more about some kind of boots on the ground examples of, of the procurement process and the cost sharing issues, if any. Of, are you cost sharing? Are you, are you collaborating with other local agencies? So with that, with that in mind, I want to ask you, I mean, do you coordinate with any state, local, or federal agencies in the procurement process, or do you simply do it on your own? And if you do, how, how is it working? Yes, sir. We do do it on our own. Um, we call around to those vendors that we've used successfully in the past. Um, and again, it's sometimes we run into the shortage problem where they're just out of dogs and they haven't taken their trip overseas and, and their stock, they just don't have it. Um, we'll have to look around a little more. We do collaborate after the purchase process on training um, because it is not, it's not fiscally wise to run a four or five month training scenario with one dog and one you know, cop. So um, we do call around to whether it's municipal or county agencies to see who has new handlers. Basically that's the problem is handlers come and go. Every once in a while you lose a dog from age or medical purposes and then we'll put on joint training classes to certify that team. All right, so you've heard from uh, Dr. Otto and Ms. Goff today at length about the procurement processes and some of their suggestions, and it does sound like that is, again, where the, where the, where the problem is, uh, and you know, even for you on the local level, right? You, uh, you, sometimes you can't find a dog, so um, you've heard some of their suggestions, and uh, I'd ask you to be frank and tell me, what do you think? I think the business model is going to be a problem. Um, I believe that is the main, <laughs> I think that's the main problem with people who get into the business model is I referred to them as used car salesmen earlier. Um, they're not truly in it for the dog and they're not truly in it for our end purposes. They're in it to make the money. And in order to do that, they have to push a large amount of animals through their inventory quickly and that you know, I think that goes to what maybe you were talking about is how cheap are these dogs and why are they selling them so cheap in Europe? Because realistically, if they've held on to them for a year and they've fed them and they've done the vet test and, you know, everything like that, those prices probably should be higher, but for whatever reason, they're not. And that's why we're getting them from over there because here in the States, when you hold, hold the puppy from eight weeks to 12 months, they've incurred that bill as the breeder and they have to recoup that from us um so you know whether or not it's the the puppy mill terminology and they just don't they have a disregard for the animal itself and those that don't make it who knows what happens to those dogs um you know some of that probably does happen in europe where it's not going to happen here in the states so any suggestions on how to address that issue Unfortunately, I think that's well above an end user person like myself. <laughs> um, you provided some pretty good insight, though, and I appreciate it. So, I, I, and, and thank you for the opportunity. But um, I really like I, I'm stuck on how to how to solve that problem because I, I, as an end user, I wish we could get our hands on dogs easier, um, and in that in that age range of a year and a half to two years. Um, because we have had problems with getting them at a month old, you know, um, there are age determination problems sometimes when you get them from Europe. Oh, yeah, he's 16 months old. And come to find out, he's not really 16 months old. He's, a, you know, he's a year old. Um, and that's a problem. And we've wound up having to return dogs or retire them just because they didn't, they didn't make it through our training. And, and obviously the, the full service training aspect of it is a little more strenuous than the single purpose aspect of it and they go through a lot more and that's some of the problems that we have. Okay, thank you, I yield back Mr. Chairman, thank you. Chair now recognizes the ranking member, uh, Ms. Demings, for at least five minutes, maybe longer since I got out of order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe I'll take a full 15. Uh, I, 
again, want to thank our witnesses because this has just been so uh, beneficial for us to hear some of the behind the scene uh, processes and some of the challenges that uh, we are facing. Uh, Dr. Otto, I think we'll uh, begin where we left off and that's involving the test standards. Uh, the TSA uh, K-9 teams, of course, work in areas such as airports where there are a tremendous amount of distractions. And does it make sense to you that the TSA would develop test standards that reflect the unique conditions that their canines operate in? Absolutely. I, th I think it's appropriate. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record a letter from the TSA. Without objection. Thank you so much, and I'd like to share a quote from them that says, canines displaying a minimum amount of reward drive and search behavior may be acceptable for a canine slated to work single suspect vehicle or occasional VIP motorcade, but it would be unsuitable when the expectation is screening passengers at an airport checkpoint uh, where the use of canines acceptable to screening purposes screening persons is still relatively new to explosive detection canines. Dr. Otto, do you agree that more canine teams or believe that more canine teams are needed at the state and local levels as their responsibilities continue to grow? We've heard Lieutenant Smith share a little bit about the additional uh, use of canines. I think the demands are you know, skyrocketing and it certainly makes me feel more comfortable when I get back on Amtrak to know that there are canines um, at Union Station. Are you aware of domestic vendors that are actually working on uh, canine, training canines to meet TSA standards? Are you aware of any vendors that are actually working with the TSA to develop standards for their canine teams? As far as developing standards, I am not aware. I do know that there are several vendors that are working with TSA, um, particularly on the person-born um, explosive detection dog. Thank you. Um, can anyone share what is the average cost of requiring a canine and training it, whether single-purpose use or multi-purpose? What's the average cost? I can tell you that we pay anywhere from 9,000 to 13,000 per dog, and that is before the man hours are adjusted into, in the state of Florida, 480 hours for a full service dog. Nine to 13,000. Correct, and that would determine, uh, that, that's based on how much training it has in it already. Um, vendors sell some dogs that are considered to be titled, and they have more training once we get them. Ms. Goff, any? I, was, I would have said that we've heard a, a wide range of numbers based uh, also on the training, uh, but that, that's uh, along the lines that we've heard. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Rogers, uh, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Otto, you, we'll talk a little bit about... Uh, this people working together. You made reference to it a little while ago about the collaboration, the sense of it you're sensing. Ten years ago, roughly, I also a member of the Armed Services Committee in addition to Homeland Security. I wanted to try to get the canine community, breeding community, and training community to agree on uh, working together to develop a standard that of, of, of physical capability, but also training that the government could rely on for purchasing, whether it's for the military or for Homeland Security, it was impossible to get these folks to work together and agree. Everybody felt their way of training was superior to everybody else. Do you sense that's dissipated in any way or changed? Because you talk about this center uh, of, ex of excellence and, and this sense of cooperation. I worry that we're going to see that devolve again. I, I think it's a risk, but I do think there is a change. I think that all of the organizations are realizing that they no longer can get the dogs that, that they want, and so they're all feeling this pressure, and they realize they need to cooperate. And the fact that we had all of the representatives at the AKC meeting, and we all agreed 
on kind of the general direction was really exciting. And I think you laid a lot of the groundwork by setting those, you know, the seeds for that. And I think the timing and the cost and the struggle that people are having is really forcing them to, to have to work together. Yeah, I wanted to get to, uh, I think the point Ms. Demings was getting at on, on the, the price that, that folks like you are having to pay. Uh, and, and the government's paying higher than that in some situations for, for the top-notch canines is, and I have Auburn in my district, and, and Auburn's uh, success rate on dogs that can make it is vapor weight, which again is the standard, uh, is about 60 to 70 percent of, of the dogs that they produce in their breeding program. It's my belief if through organization and research that we can get that production and success rate to 80, 85 percent, then that business case is going to close so that they can sell that 80 or 85 percent at the 15 or 20,000 dollars level. And then the passenger screening dogs would come in at the 10 or 12,000. And then the dogs that can't do that but could maybe be great for single uh, detection searches or cadaver searches or drug dogs or whatever could be then sold for whatever the market would bear to get the waste out so the business model closes. I, that's what I'm after in trying to, to get a breeding program stood up and supported by the, the federal government. Ms. Um, Goff, uh, DHS has struggled with procurement and uh, writing capabilities requirements for years. What do you think that DHS uh, can do to, to make more clearly what the, uh, make more clear what they are? Uh, expectations are when it comes to American canine companies and, and uh, the product that they're wanting to have processed through their screening programs? Well, first I'd like to say it's, it's, a, t it's a tough challenge. Um, there's a lot of subjectivity when it comes to training. Having said that, um, one of the things that, that, that we've had with discussions with DHS um, and vendors is that we need to have specific um, sort of standards uh, for the baseline of these types of dogs. So that's to say that when you, when you bring one of these dogs in, these, we're talking about untrained dogs, or what they define as untrained dogs. Some of those dogs are going to go on to do additional training and to, to go to essentially higher levels, like the vapor weight le level. But if you can develop a, a single standard of what a dog who's going to be a detection dog should be able to achieve, whether, it, you know, again, it's, it's environmental, mental, physical, um, in all the various types of health, um, and then the standards for training spell out. So are those what requirements you need that not written with enough specificity now? Is that your argument? I'm sorry. Are those requirements not written with enough specificity? Very, the, the, the requirements are are very vague right now. Okay. What about after uh, action, when somebody goes through the the training facility and their dog is not successful, or, or the screening facility? Uh, are, they, are you giving clear feedback? Are you hearing that they're giving clear feedback about what the shortcomings were? We have unfortunately heard they have not been getting clear feedback. Um, we have heard a lot of frustration from people who have spent a lot of time providing what they thought the government wanted based on the scope of work, um, and then have heard that, well, the scope of work can range from anything along a set of guidelines to, well, it is subjective. So we can nail down a clear, concise scope of work. What do these dogs need to do so that they can be better prepared? We think, we think we'll have uh, a better response from breeders and vendors. Great. Uh, my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, offer my final questions for Dr. Otto for the record. And with that, I yield balance my time. Without objection, so ordered. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies, sir, thank you for being here today. Lieutenant Smith, I was a police officer for 14 years, SWAT operator for 12. Uh, been on hundreds of missions with canine guys, and uh, you're a special breed, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> so thank you for your service. And uh, I'd like to ask you, you know, this is a nation that's $20 trillion in debt, and of course we have to, we have to find the, the most efficient and wise expenditure of the people's treasure. That's one of the reasons that some of us are pushing heavily for the increased use of canine teams, because some of the alternatives of, of technology are very, very expensive. And we talk about the expense of a given dog right now um, being up to 25 grand 
for a canine. We'll cover that in a second. But let me just ask, Lieutenant Smith, in your, in your career, do you know of any, any known technology uh, that can duplicate the performance and versatility of a, of a good canine team? Not even close. Thank you very much. So let's talk about the expense of the dogs. When you have a broad spectrum detection uh, certification level for a dog, uh, explosives, narcotics, cadaver detection, uh, human spore tracking, each one of these certifications levels, would that not add to the value of a dog if that dog is already certified uh, in, that, in that detection technique? Yes, sir, I would. And thank you. So you could either buy the dog that's already certified with these various broad spectrum skills, or if you intended for the dog to have that skill, you'd have to send that dog and his trainer to that school, would you not? You would. Which would increase the expense of the dog if you, if you make that comparison. I think that's very reasonable, don't you? Yes. Okay, so the other expense of a, of a canine dog, is it not the bloodline of the dog? Isn't that considered? Is that for me? Isn't that considered? Is, isn't there sort of a culture amongst uh, canine cops? And I wish my brother was still here to have a dog with a deep bloodline. Yes. Yes. But Miss Goff, don't you don't you agree? Or let me not put words in your mouth, ma'am. I would suggest that dogs bred and raised here in the United States, although their bloodline might not run as deep and appear as pure and pedigreed, uh, they'd still be quite capable of performing as a canine dog. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Thank you. So it, if we can shift this culture, LT, from amongst our brothers and sisters that are canine operators, and from, from having a dog with a deep bloodline to an AKC registered and trained dog, wouldn't you believe that'd be an efficient expenditure to people's treasure and a very effective choice? Yes, sir, it would. Okay, let's jump to officer retention and what the, how that impacts. My question to you specific, Lieutenant, is when you, what impact does canine reassignment to, to a new handler uh, when you, if, if you lose an officer to another department or he transfers to uh, another section within your own department and you have to reassign a canine, what generally happens with that dog? So if you're keeping the same dog and the dog is fully trained, they still have to go through the same amount of training in Florida. I talked about the 480 hours. They still have to do that 480. It's a little more turnkey for the cop because the dog already knows what he's doing. Um, and it's just a matter of time to get the officer up, but they still have to put those hours in. So that team is off the road and away from those assignments for that 480 hours. So they can't perform because they're, they're, they're being repaired. Correct. Right. And, and has it been your experience, sir, uh, that, that sometimes the dogs that, that cost you less money when you, when you first got them end up to be better performers than the dogs that cost more money? In some cases, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that this has been a thank you for holding this hearing. This has been, uh, I think this is exactly the course of action we need to take on this subcommittee. And, and I, I, for one, am a, a loud and vocal advocate for the increased use of canines in their teams. And I thank the ladies and the gentlemen for appearing before us today. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Um, I recognize myself now for a few minutes of questions, as uh, undefined as that might be. Um, Lieutenant Smith, one of the reasons we're holding this hearing is because conversations that I had with Ranking Member Demings and, and Chairman Katko, and I want to uh, recognize them and, and as law enforcement professionals, they've been invaluable and uh, educating me about uh, some of these issues. But th the primary concern that I had that I brought up to both of them and they shared this concern is the, um, 
lack of perimeter security at airports. Uh, I, I think all three of us fly every week, and I can't speak for them, but uh, I'm going in and out of airports where it is not rare to see no security at the drop-off point. And then to get inside the airport in the ticketing area and not see any security. Um, does, does that concern you? Yes, absolutely, especially from the history of certain terrorist events. I, I would expect that answer. In talking with uh, Ranking uh, Member Demings about the jurisdictional issues between local law enforcement and, and TSA and, and, um, uh, and trying to decide um, how this needs to be layered, whether it should be local law enforcement deploying the canines versus TSA, I think that's yet to be resolved. But I do think the issue is, is that we need more quality dogs. We need a much uh, more visible presence. You made a statement uh, very early on that uh, just the appearance of, of a dog or, or a canine unit is a deterrent. Uh, and I, I mentioned airports. I think the same thing is true of um, surface transportation hubs and uh, major events. Uh, I, this is the, the primary focus of this is, is figuring out how do we get more dogs approved and, and particularly domestic dogs, but how do we get those deployed? Uh, what resources do, do we need to provide to make that happen so that we avoid uh, a, a, another catastrophic event like we've just witnessed in Las Vegas? Well, I think for the end user, no matter how successful you are with the domestic breeding program and that it's going to come down to a budgetary concern for the local agency. You know, whoever is the authority over the international airport or the domestic airport or whatever, um, it's going to come down to actually being able to pay for those dogs no matter what the price point is. Um, so whether there's any assistance, you know, from the federal government or anything like that, that's going to be the biggest concern. because. People raise their hand and want to work with a dog, you're, you don't have a shortage of that. You'll have the officers that want to come out and do that job. It's, it's a matter of actually being able to fund it at, at our level. Well, one of the things that we were talking about earlier, and, and um, Congressman Rogers brought this up, and, and I think I brought it up in my questions earlier, is reducing uh, the number of dogs that are rejected um, and I think one of the ways you do that, Dr. Otto, is that you have very clear evaluation standards. And um, uh, you, you have, uh, can you tell us how, for, for instance, TSA sets and evaluates standards uh, for passenger screening and explosive detection? I'm afraid I can't tell you how they do that because I haven't worked directly with them. We use the TSA screening process for our puppies mm -hmm. um, to see if they're able to enter in, but I have actually not worked with the TSA at the level of that training and evaluation. Well, wouldn't it make sense that if local law enforcement, for instance, they have jurisdiction uh, over local airports, uh, if they're within their, their city limits or their, their area of jurisdiction, so there's going to be overlap. Wouldn't it make sense that there be set standards across the board uh, so that when you have local law enforcement or, or other law enforcement interacting with federal agencies like TSA, you've got uh, the dogs all trained to the same standard? And I, I realize the handlers will, you know, that, that changes some things somewhat. But wouldn't that make sense that everybody's training to the same standards? Um, I, yes, I believe, and I, I believe that, that um, DHS has been doing some, some testing, and I think one of the things about the standards, too, is who is evaluating the dogs. Um, it really does need to be an outside group evaluating the dogs as opposed to an internal um, assessment, and I think that might be where some of our challenge also comes if we're doing, if we're sort of evaluating ourselves, we're a little softer than maybe we should be. Is there enough capacity to supply uh, our domestic needs, whether it's TSA or local law enforcement? Is there enough domestic capacity to provide those dogs? Currently, I don't think that there is. I think that that's why we need to move on to a dedicated breeding program, and I think we need to realize that there's a two-year lag 
um, from the time we start breeding. So if we want them tomorrow, we needed to be planning this two years ago. Okay, that goes back to the business model that I think we're going to have to develop and, and, and the resources that uh, uh, Congressman Rogers mentioned. Um, unless there are other members with questions, um, I thank our witnesses for appearing uh, before us today. I would like to just make this point. Again, uh, this has been a very collaborative effort uh, uh, by the, uh, both subcommittees and uh, um, even though uh, Chairman Katko and Ranking Member Demings and I began talking about these issues months ago, the timeliness of this joint hearing is not lost on the members of, this, of these two subcommittees. Uh, the horror that we saw took, taking place in, in uh, Las Vegas Sunday night loomed large over us uh, as a, another reminder of the dangers that we all face and the responsibility that we share to ensure the safety and security of all Americans. And, and to echo what has already been said, we uh, pray for the, for the grieving families who have lost loved friends and loved ones and, and pray for the full recovery of those who are injured. Uh, the hearing record will remain open for two weeks for any member to submit a written opening statement or questions for the record. If there is no further business without objection, the, subcommittee stand, the subcommittees stand adjourned.